Okay, hi everyone. It's um, just after one and I just wanted to welcome you to the webinar on streamlining your research workflow using OSF and storage integrations. Um, thanks for joining us. We're really excited to bring, um, bring you all in and explain a little bit more about using the OSF and how you can use them with other um, tools that inter integrate um, directly into the OSF. So um, hopefully we'll be able to talk to those that are seasoned OSF users that are using the OSF as part of their research workflow, but also to those that haven't, um, haven't yet joined the OSF or are thinking about it or interested um, in, in the OSF and how it could support your, your workflow needs. Um, so just a quick background on, on, the, um, on the Center for Open Science. Um, we have a mission to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that develops open source um, code um, to support our infrastructure. And it's, uh, our tool is free for researchers. Uh, let's see, my laptop doesn't wanna work. Um, so our organization has three main pillars. Um, one, the first is policy, where we work um, with organizations to in develop incentives to embrace the change um, of open science in the research culture. Um, the second pillar is research uh, to do our own um, collection of evidence to evaluate how the change um, is progressing. And the third is infrastructure to um, develop um, and maintain the technology to enable um, the research culture change. So you've probably seen this, um, this diagram before looking at how um, a culture change can take place. This first step is, is looking at the innovators um, who will quickly adopt new and exciting innovations um, and then you start to have some of those early adopters and, and, and you'll move through this curve to add more and more folks to this um, culture change adoption um, curve. And one of the things that we do at COS is really uh, put our areas of focus and effort against that so that we can support that culture change in everything that we do. So the first is to develop the infrastructure to make it possible for those innovators and very early adopters um, to, to embrace um, the changes um, and have uh, the tools they need to, to begin to conduct that in their workflows. Um, and to enhance the user interface and the user experience to make it easy to really meet researchers where they are and to reduce the burden as much as possible. The next is to work with communities um, to make it more normative within your community to see more of your colleagues um, taking on these new practices in their workflow um, and making it more normative. Next is to make it more rewarding to provide incentives um, in the research um, ecosystem that support those that are taking on this new process change. Um, and then to have the policies that enable this to be more of a required activity among everyone so that there's equity in the practices. So that's just a quick background on COS and the work that we do. Um, and I just want to go through really quickly what we're going to cover in this webinar. Um, so next, we're going to work into the OSF and we're going to look at sort of the OSF project space. I'm going to demonstrate it for you and show how it supports the entire research lifecycle. Um, again, it supports transparency, collaboration, sharing and reusability of research. Then we're going to look at OSF integrations in the landscape. Um, there's several different types of um, integrations that the OSF supports, and we're going to hone in on the storage providers specifically for this webinar, but we want to make you aware of the others and that the, and that the OSF has a public um, API, which allows community developed tools to easily interoperate with the OSF. Um, then we're going to look at um, the different specific provider integrations, give you a little bit more about the technical um, overview and how we work with the community to develop um, what are the priorities um, within those integrations on the OSF. Um, and then we'll look at demonstrating exactly how you could use an add-on um, in your workflow. And we'll, we've got some use cases that we want to share with you today that hopefully help identify some of those areas where it might also work well for you. Um, and then we're going to show you how to kind of evaluate the different add-ons um, for the different types of functionality that are supported in the OSF that might also help um, 
look at what might work best for your workflow. So I want to leave this slide up for just a second um, to give you a chance to uh, get this link um, on the OSF because this is where I'm going to be um, showing you uh, the demonstration aspects of today's webinar, but I really encourage you to go here and follow along with us. And it's something that you can look at after if you're trying to think back on some of the things we talked about and implementation into your workflow. This might be a really good resource because there's going to be lots of examples here. Um, so I'm going to leave this up for just a second. One of the other things I wanted to mention about just the operational of the webinar today, we encourage you to write in in um, the Q&A box any questions that you have as we work through this. You might think of very general questions about um, the add-ons uh, in general or the OSF architecture or some of the workflows it supports, or you may have very specific things about your project needs um, and how this could apply directly within your workflow. Please ask any and all of these types of questions. We're going to try to talk mostly general today when we answer those questions, but the team is um, is also on this call. And so we will follow up with you on those very specific questions to help provide resources and answer any of those details so that you feel like you got what you needed um, from our time today. And so the next thing is that we're going to have some polls um, as part of the webinar experience today, just to gauge a little bit more about um, what brought you here today, what some of your needs are, and so that we can, um, again, develop more community-driven um, features and functionality within the OSF. So if you don't mind, take a second um, and answer some of these polls um, as we go along, if you're, if you're willing, that would be helpful. Um, and I think that's it. So I am actually going to stop sharing this slide deck with you and, um, pop over to the OSF in just a second. But in the meantime, if you don't mind um, taking that poll to give us a little bit of quick feedback, that would be appreciated. Okay, while you're doing that, thank you. I'm going to get ready for sharing my screen. Okay, I think everybody can see the OSF project that I have up. Okay, um, so we'll leave the poll up maybe, I don't know, 30 more seconds to make sure um, everybody gets a, an opportunity to put in their, their feedback. Um, but in the meantime, if you can navigate to the GUID that I shared earlier, um, this is a public project on the OSF that we use a lot for demonstration and, um, and webinars. Um, so it's, it's something you can refer back to anytime that you want. So a couple quick things about the OSF that I just want to give as, a, as an overview. Um, the OSF is a collaborative um, management workspace. Um, it should support every aspect of the research lifecycle, all the way through um, planning and managing collaborations, access, permissions, to conducting your research, sharing um, specific data and, and data sets, um, and other resources and materials, um, either within your collaboration team or publicly with others. Um, and, and storing those things on the OSF or in one of the integrations that we're going to talk about soon. And then um, the aspects of pre-registration, reporting your outcomes, disseminating, um, sharing um, manuscript scripts and preprints, to finally discovery and reuse of, of the shared materials. So, so that's it in a, in a really broad stroke kind of sense. And so here is um, the much more detailed aspects of that with um, you know, a populated OSF project. So I'm just gonna do a quick tour. We can always um, answer specific questions at the end about the OSF functionality, but I really wanna get into the integrations and those workflows specifically. So I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on that. Um, so at the top, you can see this is a new, a new project that I've created and I've given it a title. Um, I have some metadata that I can add to my project because it's public when others discover it, they can learn more about my project if I add a description. I can also license this project so that it's very clear how the materials that I've made public can be, um, can be used and reused um, in the future. There's a um, Oh, a wiki space that allows me to share even more content um, in detail. And there's lots of great functionality within the wiki. Unfortunately, we won't have time to get into that, but I encourage you to explore that. 
for, for great ways to embed files, annotate and share specific resources within your team or with um, others publicly that might visit. But we're gonna look at con contributors just because this is um, one of the very first steps that um, are really important in setting up your project space. Realizing that the OSF project space is very flexible and it allows you to create the structure that works best for whatever your, your research um, needs are. So I have added some collaborators, but it looks like I've got others that are requesting access. So I can um, add them um, to my project. And this is a really nice feature because it allows you to share with those that you think you're going to be working with, but always be open to others joining and collaborating with you. And in adding people, you can select um, what type of permissions you want to give them. There are three options, which um, if you ever forget what, what, what they can do, I love this little um, question mark icon that you can hover over and you can see that. So looking at read, they can see the, the content um, and comments. Read and write actually have a lot more access to add and configure components and edit content. And administrators can do all of those things plus manage other collaborators um, delete and register the project and also uh, be able to turn something public or private. While this is um, kind of in the weeds, what's important about this is that the OSF project structure allows you to create components within a project. So you can see several over here on the right, literature review, materials, data, um, and analysis scripts. These are just example components within this project structure, but for each of these, I can determine which collaborators get access and what level of access they get. I can also decide if these, if these components are public or private. This is really important when we talk about um, integrating with specific storage providers, and so hopefully we'll get into the details about that, but I just want to point that out right now because if you connect, for example, your S3 bucket into your data component because that is how your tool is set up to spit out data, you can keep that component private until you've done analysis and anonymize, for example, that data and put it in a more publicly sharing um, format. But all of that, um, sort of gives you the quick overview of, of the um, way that you could structure the project and um, be able to control the access to the materials. Another important aspect for collaboration is that there's a, an activity log on every project, which means um, if several of us are collaborating on, on everything within this project, including the components, I can see all of that activity when I come and, and view the project. So that, that means that you know, different people can be, do, do, be doing different aspects of the work um, at any time and you can stay up to date with what's going on. You can also um, set notifications in your settings, um, allowing you to get notifications about the project activities. Um, so if there are file activities, files updated, you can set a uh, notification that'll uh, send you an email and let you know who did what, um, and you can do that across your components as well. I find this really handy, um, especially when I'm collaborating with other members of my team to make sure that I keep up to date with what's up, um, getting done and what, you know, what hasn't changed recently. So I think next we're gonna move into the add-ons section. Um, this is obviously the, the main focus of today's um, webinar, but here you can see where we have two different types of um, storage uh, of add-ons. One is citations. So we have integrations with Mendeley and Zotero allowing you to manage those, um, those citations and keep track of different things that you've saved in your different Mendeley or Zotero folders. We're going to get into those in real detail in just a minute. I just want to give you a quick overview. And then we have storage. Um, there's 11 different storage um, integrations with the OSF uh, which allows a lot of flexibility in where you might already be working and allow you to co connect that directly with the OSF. And what's really great about the way these integrations have been um, created is that they allow interoperability. So when I connect my Google Drive, if I make an update uh, by adding a new file to that specific drive folder that's connected to my project, it's automatically reflected in my drive if I were to go directly to the drive and vice versa. So they're synced um, together, which is great. Um, and it also means that if I'm sharing my Google Drive in this project, a specific folder, I don't have to share that drive folder with you because um, I, I think we're all familiar enough with Google Drive to say that I could share that folder, but I could also just connect it to the OSF. 
and I'm doing the same thing, which is really nice. You don't have to think uh, and go outside and do these extra activities. Um, it's, it's all done um, within the OSF, which makes, I think, the workflow much simpler, much more streamlined. Um, and then the, the last part I just want to highlight is, again, one of the reasons we asked the polling question and, and, and something I just want everybody here and um, even seeing this recorded after the fact, we're always interested in hearing from our users about what integrations would support their workflows. Um, that's something that, you know, we put in these um, because these were the ones most wanted by our, our, our user base, but there's certainly, we understand that things change over time and that new tools are being developed and, you know, updated in ways that support the workflow much more than maybe they did a few years ago. So that's the kind of um, feedback that we're always interested in hearing. And so I encourage you to, to share that with us. Um, our roadmap is very much community driven um, through our funders and other ways of support. This is the type of enhancement they want to see to the tool to make it more usable and meet researchers where they are. Okay, I think um, we have one more. No, we have several more polls, but we're going to go ahead and put one up right now. And I think Fitz, um, who is a member of our engineering team who has worked a lot on these integrations and making them possible um, for OSF users, wanted to share a little bit about the technical um, architecture behind it and what, you know, what makes it so interoperable. So I'll turn it over to you, Fitz. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, well, uh, so the core of our file storage transfer system is a system called Water Butler. Uh, and what Water Butler does is it essentially acts as a translator uh, between the external provider that we're trying to connect to, like Box or Dropbox, um, and into this kind of neutral language that we designed. Uh, and each provider that can, uh, that can, they can connect to Water Butler, that can speak Water Butlerese, can then speak to anybody else who can speak Water Butlerese. So that, in that way, that's how we can make it so that Dropbox can talk to Box, and Box can talk to S3, and S3 can talk to Google Drive, and they can all talk to all OSF storage. Um, when we're designing, what, or when we're approaching a new integration like this, the key things we're looking for is how do we manage to do um, authentication? because that's a big part of it. Um, if you want to actually connect something specific to the OSF, uh, it usually is, wants to be something specific that you own. So the provider has to be able to uh, distinguish users and provide some sort of mechanism to securely authorize users and allow them to get access to their files and folders. Um, that's pretty common, but not all providers do that, and, or not all providers do it well. We've actually had a few that we've investigated where uh, that just ended up being a deal breaker. Uh, the way they supported it, or just their lack of support for that made the, the, the integration infeasible. Um, and then the other big thing is uh, we need a documentation that describes how you sort of programmatically interact with the files and the folders on that uh, service. And again, most of the big ones are really good about documenting this. Um, if I want to find out how I can you know, delete a file on Dropbox, they've got a nice little web page that describes all that. Uh, and then when I'm writing the provider, I can just take the bit that says, hey, the, the command to Waterbutler that says, hey, delete this file and turn that into something that uh, uh, Dropbox can understand. Um, what we can do with that is gonna depend on each provider. Um, some things like revision support, some providers uh, support revisions for files, like they'll actually keep a history of all the changes made to the files. Other providers, I believe, um, OwnCloud is an example, does not really support that. Um, so the actual uh, subset of things that we can provide is gonna be dependent on the provider. But again, that's something we look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, our best supported providers let you do uploads, downloads, deletes, uh, move copies, we can download entire subdirectories as zips and um, uh, get revision information, all sorts of really fun stuff. Um, and uh, so if there is a service that you're interested, interested in connecting, that's essentially the first thing we have to do is we have to look at that, check, verify the authentication component, look at the uh, file communication component, and just make sure they're both up to spec, up to snuff, and then we can start writing the provider. Um, and that's just kind of the general structure of Water Butler. Uh, I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Eric or is it Nikki. Apologies. Uh, Nikki, sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm going to turn it back over to Nikki. Uh, but thank you very much. Thanks, Fitz. That was a great overview. Uh, I could not have explained that. <laughs> so that was awesome. Um, actually, Eric's going to get back into the demo. He's got his screen shared, um, and he's going to walk through some of the use cases that um, we think might resonate with you all. 
Yeah, thanks, Nikki. So um, I'm going to pick up where Nikki left off. We're going to stay in the same project so that you continue to use that uh, link that we dropped in the chat and we can share again uh, if there's some new folks who didn't get to pick that up. Um, and so you can continue to, you can reference this later um, and we'll tell a little story here. And this is not just one that we've sort of made up, but rather based on the experiences uh, of many members of our community that um, have shared you know, their their stories and um, the, the whole reason that we, we build out uh, integrations the way we do is based on those experiences, um, learning from researchers and members of research communities. So in this case, um, this project, as we see, has been uh, around for a few months and there's been some activity. And Nikki shared a little bit of how the, the contributors have been added and uh, components and structure have been added um, over time. We can see there's already activity and actually a couple of add-ons already um, uh, attached and active here. Um, and then I have been added and as part of this project I have some unique contributions to make. I may have, uh, there's a, you know, a Google Drive folder active here and a Dataverse active here, but I have some activity that's taking place in different providers and um, in sort of opposing the, the, the story that uh, Fitz had told us, not all of these providers talk to each other by default. Um, many times if I have activity in, in um, Dropbox that um, we're gonna activate here in a second, by default, I can't just send those back and forth into to Nikki's Google Drive activity, but on this uh, OSF's collaboration space, we have an opportunity to bring those together um, without having a lot of downloading and uploading between hard drives and emailing files. Um, this is our the space we were looking at just a moment ago. We can see that uh, Nikki is attached or has connected the Google Drive add-on here recently uh, to the top level project. And I have another piece that I need to include in this project that um, I'm do I've been working on in, in Dropbox. So um, because we can see the Dropbox has not been connected here yet, um, in many cases, these uh, add-ons are, uh, are connected by using an authentication process so that both those providers, this case Dropbox and the OSF, can uh, identify that I'm the person and these are the accounts that I claim them to be. Um, so we are trying to be very clear about um, what the OSF in this case is, is asking to do. It's asking for several permissions, in this case to, um, to read and download um, and files from these providers to the OSF. I'm gonna go ahead and confirm that. And so now I have the Dropbox add-on is now available in my configurations here, and there's no account connected yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And as I've said, anytime there's an authentication process, I will be sent to the provider to uh, authenticate that I am the person that I claim to be. So I'm gonna coincidentally using yet another authentication process through Google to, to prove who I am. Uh, again, the OSF is gonna ask for those permissions that were clarified before and step earlier. And now I have an opportunity, this Dropbox uh, doesn't have a lot of structure to it, just the, the Dropbox itself that I'm gonna choose from, go ahead and connect it. And so we'll see on our, our full list now, we have the Dropbox enabled, we can disable it if necessary, but we don't need to do that right now. But when we turn to our front page of the project, Within our files, um, we'll still have the Dataverse that, we're, that was connected before. We still have the Google Drive files that Nikki connected. And then we also have a Dropbox um, folder that can be used to move files back and forth. In this case, all, this file is already on Dropbox. This happens to be a PDF of the slides we were just looking at earlier, so that those are now 
uh, available on the project to reference and download. Um, and so the, when you start from, from scratch and the, the add-on has not been activated at all, you go through those authentication processes and now we both have the platforms where our, our files originated uh, connected to our, our OSF account. We can both interact with these now as administrators of this project without needing to be, have access to those um, native platforms. So I don't need to have access to uh, Nikki's Google Drive folders in order to see this content that she's indicated as part of an OSF project because we've connected them here. So a couple other, uh, one of the other advantages of the structures that Nikki mentioned earlier with components, there's the ability to have the different um, contributors as well as permissions. And then we also have uh, another opportunity to distinguish which add-ons um, are relevant to these different sections and something like a uh, literature review if one of my roles in this project age and political identification is to um, to sync up the the literature review that we've been working on with the project this would be a pretty good place to do that um, so i'm going to activate the zotero add-on which i've already uh, have used before so it's available for me to connect and when i import these I'll again, like with the Dropbox, um, have opportunities to choose uh, libraries in Zotero that are relevant to my work. So I'm not having to, to redefine all of my categories that I, that I put together in Zotero. They're all gonna be here and I can just choose the ones relevant to me. Um, I'm gonna pick one semi-relevant to our theme. This is a bibliography I put together for the uh, U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases a few years ago. We're going to connect that one. And then when we return to our literature review, we will have a Zotero section, which will populate. Oops. Let's make sure we did that right. Oh. Find one that has a new folder in it. There we go. We'll use an OSF prepped folder. Go ahead and connect that to our project. Now we have our citations will be listed. They'll listed by default in order um, that they were added to that library to that folder. Um, and you can change the, the citation style as well that those will be uh, presented in. So if I wanted a Chicago style to be the first thing that um, the user sees, then that would be uh, available um, or the first by default the visibility that that literature review will have on my literature review component here. Um, so now if I'm leaving our literature review component and want to move on to um, the analysis that we're doing. And we have scripts for our analysis. Likely this is going to live uh, somewhere like GitHub. Um, so it's not in one of those providers that we've already connected. So in our, now we're in a, a new component here that doesn't have those previously added um, providers. We're going to choose GitHub again. We have our uh, confirmation of the uh, requested permissions. Um, and so what you see here, this, this sort of pop-up, um, is in case the, the repositories within your, your GitHub account, um, for whatever reason, their, their provider is not sending them to S, uh, OSF and are providing the list of options that we're going to look at here in a second. Um, there is a, a way to quickly re-authenticate those, uh, those permissions, and I'll show you that uh, in a moment as well. So as with the other providers, we get a list of all of uh, your, your GitHub repos that you have permissions uh, for within the GitHub provider, and I'm going to choose one that we've named specifically for this event. And I'll go ahead and save that. And now among my 
files, uh, my GitHub repo material uh, will be included um, along with my other files. So again, that was an authentication process. I didn't start from the very, very beginning that time, but again, if you've used GitHub before, you've likely um, already authenticated with, with other platforms. So it's very quick, take a few seconds to authenticate those. Um, there's also cases where you may have uh, data being uh, collected um, from you know any number of sensors or, or other tools um, that are being synced with with a storage provider that you're using so something like uh, Amazon S3 is good for that as an API that's good for collecting and and syncing uh, data so that would be data from a source to Amazon S3 as a storage option um, and then we have an integration available um, with uh, Amazon S3 into the OSF so uh, through that extra link, um, you can get your synced data included in your uh, OSF project. So um, like all of those other providers that use authentication, we still um, have a, uh, we're trying to display and, and articulate all of the permissions that we're asking for on behalf of the OSF. Um, unlike the authentication providers, this one looks a little different um, and this populated for me already because I've been using this, but when you set up your uh, Amazon S3 account, um, instead of using authentication, it will provide uh, a key similar to if you've used APIs before, um, access key and a secret um, that were kind of like uh, a username and a password, but specific for your account and your material um, on Amazon. S3. So when I use those details specific to um, a uh, OSF development uh, S3 bucket that we've set up, um, I now have the specific buckets within S3 that I can choose from and uh, include in my project. Go ahead and save that. And most, uh, most of the providers do use authentication, but several do use that a similar step um, with the keys as S3 does, GitLab being another example, Dataverse uh, similarly using a uh, key to define which projects or Dataverses or buckets are to be included um, in your integration. But at the end result, um, we have our files included uh, the same way we did with GitHub or Dropbox. They're now included um, through the S3 add-on. So if your data is being synced from another source to S3, uh, it can likewise be synced from S3 to your OSF account. Uh, and then if, like uh, Nikki has added on the, the top level project, the Dataverse, um, object that uh, in most cases, if you're you're adding something from Dataverse, those are finished products. Those are data products that aren't being continuously modified anymore. Um, but you may be using them as a, a reference where they are a previous um, version of, of data that you're trying to replicate with this project. Maybe that's the purpose of this project. Um, so if we were to um, pick one of our components uh, to add a Dataverse add-on. Go ahead and enable that. Uh, and if you have Dataverse with your institution, then uh, this will look a little different and you would choose a, uh, a Dataverse that is um, at your institution. So, um, I don't know, previous step, I chose the Harvard version, um, but if your institution has their own instance, um, then you would choose that and instead of getting a list of all of the um, data verses that are on the, the Harvard Dataverse, you would just get those that are at, you know, the University of Virginia or University of Maryland, wherever your Dataverse instance is. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and choose a COS Dataverse that we set up for this and add that to our materials component. 
and then that will be available and visible on our component so that we can reference that uh, previously you know, finished and, and uh, completed data that was included in this Dataverse repository. So that's uh, a quick look at adding several different kinds of, of add-ons for different parts of your research life cycle. And as I've mentioned before, there may be cases where like GitHub, um, all of the repos that you expect for some reason are not visible when you're trying to add those to your uh, component. So to re-authenticate those, um, we have in your personal, your account settings, um, we again will show you all of the add-ons that you've already authenticated or set up uh, and list the projects or components that they are connected with. Um, and so in a case like GitHub, if I had connected GitHub to this analysis scripts component for whatever reason, it's, it's really just not um, pulling in the, the repos that I expect. Um, I can use the connect or re-authenticate step uh, to start that process from the beginning. It'll give me the permissions again. Um, well, maybe not. Okay, well, it's very much wanting me to stay authorized. Um, but in this case where you need to disconnect this information, you can actually disconnect these from both ends on GitHub. You all, likewise will show you a, a list of providers that you have authorized connections with that you can disconnect from. Um, and especially if you have changed or added a new institution or group in a case like GitHub, um, you would need to re-authenticate those uh, that connection so that you those new um, group folders or institutional folders would be available, repos would be available for you to add uh, to your project. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, as Nikki mentioned, that is um, you might be thinking about as you're, you're seeing all of these different options is list of, of things that are available to you. Some of them may already be using really obvious solution for your, your data needs or connections to your OSF project or they're available through your institution. They have an institutional Dataverse or Google Drive provider. Um, but perhaps uh, you're, you're still thinking about what is uh, appropriate for you and your projects. Um, so we have a, on our help guides, and we'll put this link um, in the chat so that you can quickly jump in and take a look at this. But in the help guides, we've uh, have guides specifically to help you connect, <clears throat> excuse me, each of those providers that we looked at today. So similar to those processes that I showed you, including reauthorizing some of those that have a, a clear uh, reauthorizing path, uh, path, excuse me, that we talked about. Um, we also have a page, and this is a continuing to grow as we add new content, uh, but to help you think about these add-ons, uh, if you're starting from, from scratch or you maybe you have several options and you don't know which one would be best in terms of, of connecting and using for your projects, um, we have a, a, a feature chart that will help you sort of quickly at a glance get an idea of all of the, uh, the things that these providers are capable of in terms, in terms of how they're connected with the OSF. Um, so this link is in this uh, add-ons health guide right here. If you need to take a look. Um, and this continues to, to change and evolve as we add new features um, and new uh, add-ons, new providers. Um, and this is a selection of the very many different variables that um, providers uh, can enable. And in some cases, as Fitz mentioned, um, some things they, they can't do or they can't do in a way that um, we could make work within our, our mission or within our policies. Um, but the chart here will give you an idea of what each of those features are. And one of the things we provide and, and try to keep up to date um, is if you were thinking about starting an account with one of these 
providers. So maybe your institution doesn't provide one or what they provide is not yet uh, available as an, OS, um, an OSF add-on, um, then this is a quick look at what you can get if you were to set up an account uh, with Dropbox, for example, then a free account, you could have two gigabytes of storage available to you, um, or with Google Drive, 15 gigabytes of storage available to you. At no cost, you would need an account, um, but no cost would be involved for those. And then uh, next to those, another a number here um, is if you are uh, moving files from OSF to those providers, there are sometimes limits for those as well that are set by the provider. So in the case of uh, Dropbox, again, if you had a paid Dropbox account that had more storage, you can move up to five uh, gigabytes of, of file size uh, at one time. Um, if you had a 10 gigabyte file that was on the OSF um, somewhere that, that would not uh, move over to the Dropbox uh, your Dropbox provider gracefully. Uh, and some of these are, are smaller uh, limits than others. Um, and then among the other features that we have included in the chart here uh, to help you make a decision about your providers um, is uh, when those files are now connected to your OSF project, are they able to be downloaded um, in, in the majority of those, that is the case. Um, and then we also try to make um, file types, uh, many, many file types um, render in the browser so that you wouldn't necessarily need to download a spreadsheet or a document in order to, to read those from an OSF project. They will actually um, render in the uh, browser itself. And when we start getting more variabilities, um, things like uh, if we have our, our add-on connected to the OSF and we start taking actions uh, on those files that are connected, um, in most cases, if we're removing it from the, you know, that list of files in the OSF that um, it will also be removed uh, from the provider. So it, it mirrors the, the same uh, content that's in those providers. In some cases, that's, that's not the case. So that if I removed a file um, from a GitLab project that I had set up, uh, if I removed it in the OSF, that's not going to delete over in the, the source uh, provider. There's also some things to, to keep in mind just in terms of if you had lots of collaboration happening and, and things are changing quickly, um, being able to rename files, uh, some of these you'll be able to easily rename the, the files themselves and uh, the GUID, those URLs that are provided would change, um, but uh, the, the, that file renaming would be enabled. So you would just want to be cautious if those are things that are already shared and linked elsewhere. Um, and then the ability to, to do some of the, the OSF functions that um, Nikki mentioned, like creating folders. Um, once you've already connected your providers in the OSF and several of the providers, you can start creating structure within those, uh, those files from within the OSF um, interface. So like with Google Drive, when we uh, have that uh, folder that Nikki had already connected if she needed more structure to um, to do things with those files that would be something she could do from inside the OSF interface would need to do it in drives to have it reflected in uh, OSF um, and then also one of the things that um, we really are, are trying to do with the OSF is have lots of transparency in the process uh, of what's all the activity that's happening on your OSF projects is similar to following the notifications like Nikki does for her team projects. Um, you might also be interested in, in having a real clear version control of all of those files. Uh, some of the providers will do a good job of um, if you were to update those files, have new versions uh, in the OSF that you would have both of those file versions available for 
users to interact with, uh, but not all of the providers will um, have that feature enabled. Um, so there's a, a few things that you might consider as you're evaluating for, for your personal projects or as a group, um, which of these providers might be um, most useful or most valuable in terms of how they themselves function and how they function with the OSF um, so that you have the features, the most important features um, for your project are enabled, um, you know, without having to, to use things that aren't uh, provided or, or perhaps using multiple um, add-ons is great as we've, we've shown. Um, but knowing what each of those are capable of uh, will help you reduce the need of, of duplicating effort or, or moving files around. Um, instead, you can all have it connected to that OSF project like we do here um, with several providers. And we can all use and, and interact with those um, together as a group of contributors. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've sort of talked about before is a thinking about and continuing to evaluate new add-ons or add-ons that aren't yet uh, included on the chart here. Um, that's something we continuously will do. We'll, um, we take uh, the, the community's needs and recommendations very seriously. So um, as institutions or researchers come forward and tell us that they use, um, you know, a OneDrive for Business, for example, um, that's something their institution enables. It doesn't currently uh, work on the OSF, but um, we have partnered with an institution to build that uh, integration that will be available early next year. Um, and that's the sort of thing we, we would do frequently and definitely want to do more of, um, but we do that based on what the community is uh, asking for and what they need and what they can partner with us to, to work on. So. Um, the more that you can tell us about your needs, whether we're already um, helping to provide for those or if we're missing a feature that would um, really help you use the, the OSF to the, to the greatest extent possible, um, then communicate with us. We'll put the support uh, desk information um, in the, the slides and in the uh, materials that we send you later. Um, so please do talk to us um, about what you use and, and what you're interested in using so that we can continue to uh, build those features for you. Um, so I think we're ready to turn it over to Nikki to wrap up and to take uh, any questions and thoughts that participants have had. Oh, Eric, so much. Um yeah, the, the last, um, I guess, 11 minutes that we have, I want to make sure that we, um, that we get to your stuff and leading into the chat there, the Q&A box. Um, I'm, I'm sharing my slide, but I can't, <laughs> but um, just, I'll do a really fast recap, which is basically a quick view of we've, we've shared with you the OSF project space um, can be flexible in something life cycle that the OSF has integrations already built into with citation managers and 11 different storage for public API um, and we didn't get a chance to really catch you of the um, community developed um, that the the API, but maybe we can drop that link in there too. Um, and, you know, the, the demonstration in the use cases was really just to get you thinking about how um, you could integrate those um, storage providers or citation managers into your workflow using the OSF just to streamline the process even more. Um, the, the last slide has a lot of these links and um, we'll make sure to pop these into um, the chat as well. So if there's anything in there that we haven't shared, we do, but I want to I want to quickly um, move over to questions. Um, and so what I think would be the best use of our last 10 minutes um, is to go to the Q and A box and we can read through some of the questions we've been answering as um, as the, the webinar has been proceeding, but um, make sure that we 
uh, explain um, some of our responses. And then there's two that we haven't gotten back to um, answering. I might go ahead and, and take those on live. Um, so the first is, let's see, if you have privately or through your university, like Page Dropbox or Unlimited University Box, or all the lists, moving files, think I don't, my understanding is that um, whatever capacity you have, George, you'll also through USF. That's that sounds correct to you? Uh, let's see, sorry. I'm actually replying to the previous one. Um, um, yes. Uh, yes, so- If you connect we, your box, you basically- Yes, um, when you connect, uh, when you connect the OSF to your Dropbox account, essentially the OSF is acting on your behalf. So it will respect whatever limits you're, uh, are being imposed by that connection. So if you're connecting through your uh, unli unlimited university box space, then you have unlimited space on box. If you connect to a paid Dropbox, then you have a paid Dropbox, you, or whatever the, the paid Dropbox limits are. Um, and anybody else who interacts with that project, anyone else that you've given right access to that project um, can copy files over there. And again, it acts on, uh, the OSF acts on their behalf. Uh, it does not give your credentials away. It doesn't, uh, you can't, it doesn't tell them, oh, here's a username and password. Now you can go do something separately. They can only do it through the OSF. Uh, but anybody, but if I, if for instance, uh, Alika and I were sharing an account and she had connected uh, through her box space, um, then if I upload something to the box, it would end up on her drive uh, and be subject to her limits, not my own. Great, thanks for that answer. I think you also answered her other question. Um, if somebody turns on that box and already has um, lots of storage, it doesn't affect that. Um, so then we can maybe hop over to um, a couple of the answered questions just to make sure um, we give these a little bit of time. Um, one of the one of the questions um, that was was asked was about um, storage locations, and um, one of the things that we we didn't um, we didn't show you at the very beginning, but um, we certainly we certainly could is when you create a new project or component. One of the options um, when you're setting the, up that project is what storage location you want to use. This is for OSF storage, which is the native storage um, that's provided um, in each of the projects um, and is also provided through Google Cloud. Um, and they have several different regions that we've connected. And so um, those are options, especially if you have those geographic uh, needs um, for data storage, this is one way to support that. I think, um, Likewise, some of the add-ons have the ability to support that too, so consider that as well if that's one of your constraints. Um, let's see, you for there one of those additional questions and I think we might be close to you. Sorry, Nick, you breaking up, so I'm not sure what you said in there. Oh, I was just asking if you want to take another question from those that have been written in. Um, yeah, well, I mean, there, there is an additional question here that just came in a minute ago. Um, talking about contributors is a little outside of our um, scope today, but um, maybe quickly mentioning uh, and we can put in the chat um, the top factor work that our policy team is doing which is not specifically about contributors but acknowledging that there are many kinds of contributions to um, to research uh, and that is not just a paper even when a paper is uh, published that there are many research objects 
that um, should be uh, included with those as well. Um, yeah, so as we're in the last couple of minutes here, we'll wrap up. Um, I think that, uh, Nikki, maybe you can just share that last slide again while you have it up. Um, there are a couple of resources that are on the last slide there, and you'll have those slides available to you if you need to actually get to those um, again, as well as any of the things that we talked about today, we'll have some links and the project itself that we use today um, will be sent to you via email, everybody who, who registered. Um, but also if you have additional thoughts, questions, recommendations, feedback, um, please do uh, communicate with us. Um, the support desk is a good way to, to reach uh, us just because that will sort of accumulate all of our feedback and knowledge. Um, so that would be terrific to hear more uh, about um, what you're working on or what you'd like to see um, added to OSF. I, there are more questions coming in, but I think um, just so that we can wrap up, um, we will write back to, to those of you that have sent more questions um, individually so that we can uh, have a conversation about those questions um, and we can let you go on time. So thank you again for uh, joining us for the meeting today and, and for um, all of your, your questions and your participation and uh, very much look forward to uh, seeing everyone at the next one. So thank you again.